thanks to everybody for coming out on a Saturday morning uh, to, to join us here, and I appreciate the invitation to speak with you this morning. So I came from the University of Pittsburgh, and I have to say one of the nice things about transitioning from the University of Pittsburgh to Stanford was my fir the picture of my, f of my first slide of all my talks is so much nicer than any of the <laughs> pictures at the University of Pittsburgh. Nothing against Pittsburgh. I'm a, a Pittsburgh born and bred, but it's very beautiful out here. So when I was assigned sort of the topic of sort of heart health, it was kind of a big topic, and so I thought I'd kind of approach it from the standpoint of uh, heart failure. And the reason I'm doing that is because I do heart failure every day, so it's sort of easy for me to do that, and it's kind of in my wheelhouse. But when we think about sort of heart health, a lot of the things that you may think about in terms of uh, problems with your heart or th risk factors, high blood pressure, diabetes, high cholesterol, uh, even coronary artery disease, a lot of those things, particularly if left unmanaged, may lead to heart failure down the line. So I think it's kind of a good forum to talk about all those things. So that's why I'm going to be talking about heart failure today. So I'll talk a little bit about sort of the types and the risk factors, some, some, a little bit, some data about outcomes. Uh, we'll focus a little bit on treatments and then talk about sort of outlook and sort of future therapies. So I have to admit, like, when I tell my friends or my parents introduce me to their friends and they say, what do you do? I say, well, I do heart failure. And people sort of like, why do you do failure? So you're like sort of, you know, you're focusing on failure and it's a really bad name and it kind of doesn't give us a good feel. There's certainly not a good, you know, warm and fuzzy when we talk about heart failure because nobody really wants to specialize in heart failure. Just ask the Cleveland Browns. Um, and so I have to say that because I apologize to anybody who's a Cleveland Brown fan, but I'm from Pittsburgh, so it's my duty to make fun of people from Cleveland and particularly the Cleveland Browns. Um, but, you know, so there's a lot of good things happening in heart failure, so don't, don't get too down on a name. So first of all, sort of what is heart failure? There's a lot of things that can cause heart failure. Um, but in the end, it's a clinical syndrome. So it doesn't matter why you have heart failure. The syndrome is the symptoms that you have. And you can see the symptoms up here. So there are breathlessness. There's swelling in your legs or your belly. There's fatigue, sort of inability to sleep at night, particularly inability to lay flat. Or once you go to sleep, you wake up feeling breathless in the middle of the night. Uh, sometimes coughing, particularly coughing at night, particularly coughing at night when you're laying flat. And I'll tell you why people get these sorts of sim symptoms. But it kind of, does, again, doesn't matter why you have these things, heart failure can cover a lot of different disease states. What's the scope of the problem? Why do we care so much about heart failure? So I'm hesitant to ask, but maybe anybody, everybody in the room who's over 40, raise your hand. I'll raise my hand. I'm over 40. OK. All right. So you get a sense. So for those of you who are over 40, we know from data that one in five of you, so 20% of you, will develop heart failure at some point in your life. So it's really important, and it's a big healthcare problem. And there's a lot of people in the US with heart failure. So if you look a couple of years ago in 2015, there's somewhere around 6 million people that had heart failure. And so to put 6 million people in context, that's the population basically of Los Angeles and Chicago. And in the not too distant future, only in about 15 years, actually getting to close to 12 years now, there'll be close to 8 million people in the US with heart failure. And that's the, the city, the, the, the population the size of New York. So there's a lot of people out there with heart failure. And it affects the country a little bit differently. So you'll see as I talk about some of the risk factors for heart failure, some of the risk factors are more prevalent in parts of the uh, country than others. If you sort of look at this map thing from the CDC, the redder the color gets, the more heart failure deaths there are. And you can see that there's a lot of heart failure death uh, in the south and into Texas and kind of up the Mississippi Valley, kind of close to where I came from in Pittsburgh. But even though it's spread out somewhat unevenly across the country, it's still very prevalent even in the areas that aren't so red. So what about prognosis? So when people talk about cardiovascular things, we do a lot of cool stuff in the cardiovascular space, and we're able to save a lot of people. So people, when we give them a cardiovascular diagnosis, tend not to think that there's a, it's, it's something that we can fix. It's not something that's going to be a big problem over time. As opposed to something like cancer, when you say, oh, I have cancer, or you have cancer, people get you know, understandably very worried about what their prognosis is over time. And this is a study, it's getting a little bit old now, so it's in the neighborhood of 15 or 20 years old, but it's, it was done in Scotland. And they looked at everybody who came into the hospital for the first time with one of these diagnoses. Uh, most of them are cancer diagnosis, and the MI is myocardial infarction, that's a heart attack. And if you've never looked at sort of these survival curves before, just to give you a sense of what they are, sort of 
time is on the bottom axis here, and it goes out to five years or 60 months. And on the y-axis, the axis going up is the percent of people that are still alive. So that if you're kind of up here when you start, everybody's alive because you're in the hospital and you're being diagnosed with something. And as people get sicker over time, these lines kind of goes down corresponding to worse survival. So the people who are down here have the worst survival compared to the people up here. And so when you divide people into men and women, again, this is the first presentation in Scotland, and you say you have breast cancer or bowel cancer or ovarian cancer or lung cancer, you can see that sort of the, the difference in survival over time. So breast cancer is less deadly than something like lung cancer. And myocardial infarction heart attack is kind of somewhere below breast cancer. So actually, I would say pretty surprising that uh, your first presentation of a heart attack, you have a worse prognosis than if you have breast cancer. For men, it's the same thing, except MI is on top here. So heart attacks are on top, followed by bladder, prostate, bowel, and then lung cancer is the bottom. So universally, lung cancer is not the thing you want to get. It's a, it's a fairly deadly disease. But heart failure is there. And I think that you know, if, you just, if you talk to people, you know a lot of people probably who have heart failure, a family member who's had heart failure. And this isn't to scare anybody, but this is just to goes to show you that it's out there, it's prevalent, but it also takes a toll. And not only is it prevalent, and not only can it lead to mortality, but it costs a lot of money. And I think that's why there's so much attention about heart failure these days. So if you go back to 2015, it's $14.3 billion for the total care of heart failure in the US. And you don't have to go too much further in the future, only about 15 years in the future, where the cost double to about $30 billion, B with a, a billion with a B. So it's a lot of money. And where the bulk of that cost comes from is from being in the hospital. There's cost from being outside the hospital, managing outside the hospital, but patients frequently get readmitted, and that's where it really puts a burden on the healthcare system. And not only sort of direct cost to insurance companies or to the government through uh, government insurance, company, insurance payments, but there's a lot of other costs too, sort of these indirect costs. So people can't go to work, and so there's lost work days. Uh, people can't do what they need to do around the house, and so there's lost productivity there. There's premature mort mortality loss, and I have to say, when I looked at this picture, I thought it was kind of a nice picture, and up here, I guess, I guess that's a dove. It kind of looks like a tweet. Um, and so, you know, I, you know, I don't think a lot of people, you know, hashtag I'm not alive anymore. Uh, so it's a little strange, but it's, it's there. You know, in Silicon Valley, I guess that people, maybe, maybe they tweet when they die. Um, and then there's other costs associated with these things that are outside of the cost that I just showed you. So it really puts a stress on the system. And it's, again, it's, there's other costs too. There's a huge burden on quality of life with heart failure. So if you look at sort of common things that people do, so say the condition impacts their ability to travel, about half the people, that it affects their relationships, again, it's a pretty important part of your, uh, your daily life, about half the people. Their ability to participate in hobbies, about three quarters of the people. And then it affects their ability to participate in family events, about two thirds of the people. And that's pretty dramatic. But I think even more so is the impact that it has on the people that are trying to care for people with heart failure. So when you ask their caregivers their ability to travel, it's 86%, so more. So they feel like they need to stay at home and be with that person. It affects the relationship even more than the person who has heart failure. Their ability to participate in hobbies, so they can't go out and do things, 87%, pretty dramatic stuff. And same thing with family events, 82%. So these are pretty dramatic effects, not only on the patient, and not only in society, but on the people that are your caregivers and that your loved ones as well. And when you ask caregivers and patients about feeling anxious or having depression, caregivers are more likely to report that they have anxiety or depression than even the person who has heart failure themselves. So it's a big problem and it affects everybody. And when you ask patients sort of what is, you know, what's keeping you from going out there and doing more. It's difficult for patients. About half the patients uh, have difficulty motivating. Depression's very common. They, d they have a lot of symptoms. So there's many reasons why they have sort of a hard time motivating, let alone just their heart failure symptoms. It can be expensive, uh, as you saw, not just hospital expenses, but it's expensive for out-of-pocket sorts of things in terms of medicines and testing. And as I sort of alluded to before, about a quarter of the patients say they don't feel like they have enough support. So even though you have a, this big burden of care, 
there's, they don't feel like they have the support network to really help them take care of themselves. And I think we need to do a better job of educating people about heart failure, um, not just sort of the dramatic slides I showed you about survival, but just sort of how it impacts your life. You can see it has a huge impact on sort of not only what you do every day, but what your caregivers and your, and your families do every day. And so if you do something simple like look at heart failure plus something else, and this is over the course of about six months in 2015 on, you know, from data from Google, say what are people Googling about heart failure plus what else? The big thing is diet. So people are sort of looking at diet. So the, how much fluid you drink, how much salt you take can really impact your symptoms with heart failure, as I'll talk to you about in a minute. But other things too, like weight gain and alcohol and flying and work and all that sort of stuff. And I think it's sort of funny that you know, people worry more about heart failure and what they eat, heart failure and what they drink, heart failure and who they have relationships with, and work is way down here at the last. So I mean, people are like, I'm guessing they have their priorities straight. You're worried about sort of your private life, not so much your, your work life. So what is heart failure and why do people get those symptoms that I showed you way back at the beginning of the talk? So just a little bit of an anatomy lesson, so pardon me if, I, if I'm being too basic here, but just to kind of get everybody on the same page. So the heart has four chambers. It has two on the right and two on the left, uh, upper chambers and lower chambers. The upper chambers are called atrium. The bottom chambers are called ventricles. So you have a right atrium, a right ventricle, a left atrium, and a left ventricle. So that's pretty much how most people's hearts work. So what's the physiology, sort of how does the heart work? And again, uh, I apologize if I'm being too basic. So all the blood from your head and from your arms that comes back, is coming back to the heart, comes down through this, this tube here, that's the superior vena cava. All the blood from your legs and from your belly come up through the inferior vena cava, and they go into the right atrium. So this is all blood that's deoxygenated. It's sort of been around the body, it's, it's delivered its oxygen, it's delivered its nutrients, it's carrying back all the bad stuff. And so it collects in this top chamber of the heart, and it squeezes and pushes the blood through a valve into the right ventricle. And then the right ventricle squeezes and pushes blood through a valve, but it can't go backwards because there's a valve here, into the lungs there. And so it goes into the lungs, it gets oxygen, and then it comes back to the heart to get pumped back out to the rest of the body. So where does it come back to the heart? It comes back to the heart to the top chamber on the left side, the left atrium. Again, it goes through this valve structure to kind of the main pumping chamber of the heart, which I'll talk a lot about today, the left ventricle. And then when, the, when that squeezes, again, it goes through another valve. It doesn't go backwards because there's a valve there. It just goes forward into this big blood vessel that comes off the top of the heart called the aorta. And then it goes up to the head, into the arms, and down to the belly, and down into the legs. And kind of round and round the blood goes. So before I kind of get into there's a few terminologies that are sort of out there about heart failure. <laughs> And you have to be very careful about language, right? Because you might, we all need to be on the same page about it. what exactly it is we're talking about, right? So this is the person who has this company who kind of recognized that they need to sort of be very clear about which truck is which, right? So here's a picture of the normal heart again. I just showed you this. And so there's kind of two flavors, if you will, of heart failure. Now, there's some other smaller, less common things like problems with your valves and problems with the sac around your heart and other things. But these, the heart failure kind of falls into one of these two big camps. The first is a heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. I'll tell you what ejection fraction is in just a second. So these are people whose main pumping chamber of their hearts, the left ventricle, doesn't squeeze very well. Um, and it tends to get bigger and kind of rounder over time. And so. It's called systolic heart failure because systole is the fancy medical term for the, the part of the heart cycle where it squeezes. Um, and an ejection fraction is basically a measure of how much blood your heart can pump out of, your, uh, pump out of the ventricle, right? So, and you and me, everybody sitting here, so if a, you have a normal heart, blood comes into that left ventricle from the lungs after it got oxygen, and then the heart squeezes. So normally, when your heart squeezes, about 60% of the blood that's in your left ventricle gets pumped out. The remainder kind of stays there and mixes with the new blood coming in, and then eventually it gets pushed out as well. So a normal ejection fraction is 60%-ish, you know, more or less. It's not 100%. When you talk about a percents, everybody sort of assumes that 100% is the best, so that's not the case. So that's what ejection fraction is. So the old term, like I said, is systolic heart failure, and I'm going to call it systolic heart failure because that's sort of my bias. Is that's what I've been calling it for a long time. Um, the sort of new fancy name is heart failure with reduced EF, or people actually, believe it or not, call it HEFREF at meetings, and that's a terrible, awful term, and I apologize to everybody out there in YouTube land who's going to be uh, watching this. I just think systolic heart failure is a much better term. 
And then there's a heart failure with a preserved EF. So these are people whose squeezing function is fine, so their ejection fraction is fine, but they still have heart failure. You say, how can that be? I get, you know, people get the, your pump doesn't work, right? So how do you, what's the problem with someone whose pump actually squeezes? So this is diastolic heart failure. Diastole is kind of the fancy word for when the heart is relaxing, or hef pef, if you want to call it that. <laughs> Believe it or not, people call it that. Um, I call it diastolic heart failure. So the filling is compromised, and people say, oh, how's that be? So the, I think the best way to think about it is if you ever tried to blow up a balloon. So the balloon is very thin, right? So when you try to blow into it, you don't have to blow too hard before it blows back up. And the pressure required to blow up that balloon is actually not too, not too high. But you can imagine if you then take the balloon and either make the balloon stiffer or make the balloon thicker, to fill that balloon up with the same volume is going to take a whole lot more pressure, right? Because it's just stiffer. And the same thing applies to your heart. So if your heart gets stiffer, even though it squeezes OK, the pressures in the heart can still go up because of its stiffness. And so whether your heart doesn't squeeze very well or fill very well, what happens inside the heart in this left ventricle is the pressures go up. And that pressure creates a back pressure. Where's the first place that goes? It goes to the lungs, right? Because that's where the blood came from in the first place. And so it can force fluid out of the bloodstream into your lungs and make a shorter breath. And if it persists, that pressure can back up to the right ventricle, which was responsible for pumping blood into the lungs in the first place, and it can make the right ventricle struggle and make the pressures in the right ventricle go up. And then eventually it makes the pressures in the veins in your body go up because that's where the blood initially came into the, to the right ventricle. And that's what causes swelling in your legs because the fluid comes out of your veins in your legs. It can cause swelling in your belly because the fluid comes out in your belly as well. Or if you can't push the blood along enough to feed the organs, the kidneys might not like it. Your brain may not like it. Your liver may not like it. So those are sort of the reasons why people have the symptoms they have, either because they don't have enough forward flow and their organs aren't happy, or they get sort of back pressure from all these, from the heart's inability to pump blood efficiently, and so they get fluid and feel uh, swollen or breathless. And so just to give you a sense of what it looks like in real life, so this is an echocardiogram. So this is an ultrasound of the heart. The, the very top of the triangle there is where the ultrasound probe is, and so everything is upside down uh, the way we normally look at it, because that's just sort of the convention. So just to kind of orient everybody, so the main pumping chamber, the left ventricle is here, the left atrium is here, the valves between the two chambers are here, the right ventricle is here, the tricuspid valve is here, the right atrium is here. So venous, ve venous blood comes in here to the right atrium, goes to the right ventricle, goes out to the lung, gets oxygen, comes back to the left ventricle, excuse me, left atrium into the left ventricle and then out to the body. So that's kind of what it looks like normally when it squeezes. This is a, just kind of a random normal heart that I pulled off the echo system last week. So this is somebody with systolic dysfunction. I think you can clearly see the difference. This is the left ventricle here. Yes, I'm playing this movie. It is actually playing, but the left ventricle is not doing much, right? And you can see that's what happens to the left ventricle over time. And this is somebody with diastolic heart failure. If you can remember back a couple of frames, look how thick this muscle is here and here compared to the, the one I showed you a couple of slides ago. So this is somebody, it squeezes perfectly fine, it just doesn't relax very well. So that kind of gives you kind of a visual sense of what I'm talking about. So the other thing that people mention are New York Heart Association, and this was developed to give you a sense of sort of how symptomatic you are. So you can be one through four. So basically, if you're one, you have really no limitations and no symptoms. So you can have a ventricle that looks like a couple of slides ago, this big baggy ventricle, but still have really no symptoms. And that typically happens in young people who don't have a lot of other medical problems. If you're Neurocard Association class four, it means you're breathless at rest. You don't even have to be doing anything. You're just sitting here like we are this morning and you feel breathless. And then two and three are sort of tweeners that are kind of between that. Two sort of mild exertion and three sort of moderate exertion. And your mild might be different from my mild and moderates, you know, so, but, so it's kind of, it's, it's rough. They're not, they're not formal definitions, but just to give you a kind of sense of sort of what your limitations are. And if you look at sort of how the global heart failure population, whether you have systolic heart failure or diastolic heart failure is cut up, it's about a third of people who are class one, a third of people who are class two, and a third of people who are either class three or class four, with a very small minority being class four. But there's also stages of heart failure. And I, the reason I mentioned both is because people tend to go on Google and you'll look at people, Google heart failure. Uh, and you get these things, so just to kind of clear up what, this, what they mean. So stages of heart failure are a little bit different. 
So stage A of heart failure means your heart is totally normal. You don't have diastolic heart failure, you don't have systolic heart failure, but you have risk factors for heart failure, which I'll talk about in a second. Stage B is you have an abnormal heart, but you don't have any symptoms. Stage C is you have abnormal heart and you have symptoms, and stage D is then stage heart failure. And so when you kind of put them together, it looks like this. So, this, so if you look at stage A, you don't really get a New York Heart Association class because you don't really have heart failure yet because you have, no, you have no structural abnormalities to your heart. B and C kind of cover New York Heart Association class one, two, and three, and end stage heart failure in class four are kind of the same term. Not exactly, but kind of. So what can cause diastolic heart failure? So these are people, again, with the stiff ventricles. They squeeze okay, but they just don't relax very well. So there's lots of different things, and actually a number of disease processes act in a bunch of different places. So it's not all just one place. So one thing is the muscles can get thick. So when you go to the gym and you pump iron, what happens to your biceps? They get bigger and thicker, right? Because they're pumping against a higher weight. So if, you're, if your heart is pumping against high blood pressure, it's pumping against pressures that are higher than it normally you're seeing. So the heart is sort of like lifting weights. So the muscles get thicker. And so when they get thicker, they get stiffer. You can also have problems like a hypertrophic cardiomyopathy with such a genetic abnormality of the actual muscles themselves. So the muscles kind of pack themselves and get with sort of abnormal protein and get bigger and thicker and stiffer. So it's not necessarily in response to having high blood pressure, it's just an abnormality of the muscle itself. You can have problems with actually the space between the muscles. So the space between the muscles is important. And if it gets scarred down, either through something like diabetes or high blood pressure over time, it can also make the ventricle stiffer as well. So the muscle cells may not be abnormal, but the space around it is. They can't sort of, the whole heart has to be able to relax, including the, the space between the cells. You can also get processes that deposit things in that space, something like amyloid heart disease. You get a whole lot of extra protein kind of deposited in those spaces that makes the heart stiffer. And as part of the process, your blood vessels tend to get stiffer over time as well. So particularly if you have hypertension, high blood pressure. Some people who have diastolic heart failure and some of the things that have caused diastolic heart failure can also cause your heart to get slower over time and not respond to exercise the way you should. So normally when you exercise, your heart rate goes up because you need more blood flow. But sometimes you don't get that when you have diastolic heart failure. And there's things in the periphery, too. Some of these changes happen in the heart, but they all can also happen in skeletal muscles, the muscles of your arms and your legs and your belly, um, that can also affect how you feel and your exercise tolerance as well. So it's not necessarily just located to the heart. It can be everywhere. So what are some of the risk factors for diastolic heart failure? It's kind of the common stuff, as I mentioned earlier. So these are things everybody knows everybody who has one or more of these things. So high blood pressure, atrial fibrillation, coronary artery disease, high cholesterol, obesity, all these things can lead to those changes I showed you on the prior slide and cause you to have diastolic heart failure. And a lot of these associated conditions can either accelerate some of those processes or make it difficult to understand why you're breathless. So there's a, a lot of times uh, the heart doctors and the lung doctors fight each other, right? So I see somebody with heart failure that has lung disease, and the pulmonologists say, oh, your lungs are fine. I'm taking good care of you. It's your heart that's the problem. And so they send you to the cardiologist, and the cardiologist says, your, your heart's not that bad. It's the, you go, go back and talk to your lung guy. That's, that's what's really going on. And so it can make it sometimes very difficult to tell the difference. And things like sleep apnea, anemia, can also contribute to breathlessness and some of the same symptoms that we need to treat these things to even find out what's really causing the problem. So treatments for diastolic heart failure, I, this is, I always used to kind of just leave a blank slide up there. Everybody's sort of expecting something. We don't have a lot of good treatments for diastolic heart failure. We've really, really tried. We've done a lot of trials in tens of thousands of patients, but we haven't found really good treatments for diastolic heart failure. So again, it's not that we're not looking. About half the world who has heart failure has diastolic heart failure. We would love to have a tr good treatment for diastolic heart failure, but we don't have it. What do we know works? If you have high blood pressure, you need to treat the blood pressure. So that's pretty simple. You tend to hold on to fluids, so we give you diuretics, and that makes you go pee. <laughs> and so that gets rid of all that extra fluid you're holding on to. And then everything else we kind of just treat. So we treat your cholesterol. We make sure we treat your diabetes. If you have sleep apnea, we make sure we treat that. We watch how much salt that you take in so you're not taking in too much salt and holding, hold on to even more fluid. If you have coronary artery disease, blockages in your heart arteries, we need to take care of that. 
we need to manage your kidneys, we need to manage your lungs, all these other things help how you feel and have impacts on your day-to-day -day life, but don't necessarily treat the problem with your heart. What about systolic heart failure? People basically fall into one of two camps. You have normal coronary arteries and you have a problem with your heart muscle itself. It could be genetic, it could be inflammatory, it could be from a lot of different causes. Some people we never really find out why they have a weak heart muscle, but it's not because they have blockages. And then the other sort of half of the group of people have blockages and have had a heart attack. So they've had limited blood supply to their heart muscle, it's killed part of their heart muscle, and so their heart muscle becomes weak over time. And so some of the things that we think about for coronary artery disease, diabetes, hypertension, high blood pressure, will keep you from getting these things, or at least they're manageable. The problem with the coronary artery disease causing systolic dysfunction is once your muscle is damaged, it's damaged. If the, if the heart muscle turns into scar, it's not going to squeeze no matter what we do. The people who have normal coronary arteries, they can come looking like that person with a really big baggy heart that looked like it was hardly squeezing at all. But with medical therapy, device therapy, and sometimes sort of a tincture of time and mother nature's help, it can actually get better or go back to normal because that heart muscle isn't necessarily irreversibly damaged. There's lots of treatments for systolic heart failure that are evidence-based. We've done trials, again, of tens of thousands of people. Uh, on your left are kind of the, 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 the core of what we use to treat heart failure. ACE inhibitors, ARBs, the new kid on the block is Entresto, which is the ARB plus the neprilysin inhibitor, so it's two medicines in one. Uh, beta blockers and aldosterone antagonists. Those are really good medicines that can make you feel better they can make you live longer and can keep you out of the hospital. And even potentially over time, if you don't have a lot of blockages, can make your heart muscle better too. The things on this side aren't as, as evidence-based or are kind of newer or don't have the impact uh, as the, the drugs on the left side. But there's, again, a lot of things out there. So the good news is there's a lot of things out there. The bad news is if you're a patient, all of a sudden you go from taking no medicines to taking a whole long list of medicines that are evidence-based. So you know, we always try and balance how many medicines we're giving you with what we think is going to be the most effective. There's also devices that help treat heart failure as well. So on this upper left panel is something called a defibrillator. People who have a weak heart muscle and systolic heart failure are susceptible to these funny fast rhythms that can cause you to die suddenly. And so the defibrillator kind of sits there and watches your heart for one of these funny fast heart rhythms. And if you have one of these funny fast heart rhythms, it can either pace your heart really fast or it can shock you to kind of bring you back to life. So it could be life saving. For certain people, they have an abnormality. Not only is their heart weak, but it's sort of inefficient. So one part squeezes and then the other part squeezes. And by pacing both sides of the heart at the same time and getting them to squeeze at the same time, it can actually make you feel better. Some, for some people, it can actually make, actually make your heart function better over time as well. And it all, for all the world, it looks like a defibrillator or a pacemaker sort of sits up here in your chest. And one of the sort of relatively new things is there's a little tiny thing. This is about the size of a dime. And it can be put in your pulmonary artery and just sits there and it can measure your pressures over time and tell us when your pressures are going up. So maybe we can start to intervene on people before they even start to get symptoms. We can go up on the doses of their water pills or change their medicines such that they don't get these high filling pressures and don't get breathless. So what if, this, what if all this great therapy, particularly for systo systolic heart failure, doesn't work? So you get the stage D Neuro Association class four type of heart failure. So there's two big options. One option is transplantation. So we can take out your heart and give you a new heart that's, uh, that works much better. Or you, can, or you can think about an artificial heart. So, so this is Tony Stark, he's Iron Man. And I don't know anything about Marvel Comics or anything, but now that there's like 800 Avenger movies out there and I have three kids, I've been to like every Avenger movie like 100 times. So I, you know, I, I, in the past I would have never thought of putting Tony Stark up here. But he, apparently Iron Man has an artificial heart. His is like nuclear powered or something. I don't know. We don't have that quite yet. But it, it makes for a good picture. So a really quick question in the last kind of five minutes here. So which came first? I'm going to take a poll of the audience. So the Beatles breaking up, the first heart transplant, or men landing on the moon? All right. So hands up for the Beatles breaking up is the, is the thing that happened first. All right. So not a lot of Beatle fans. Uh, the first, the first uh, uh, heart transplant, a lot of hands, and then men landing on the moon. Okay, so for the people who said one, so no, so that was actually the last thing of these things that happened. For people who said three, that was actually the, the second thing that happened, 
Heart transplant's been a long, long, around longer than all those things. So we, if you read your little packet here, so we're now celebrating the 50th anniversary of the first heart transplant. It's the first adult transplant in the US happened at Stanford 50 years ago. The first transplant happened a little bit, about a couple months before that in South Africa the year prior in December. But it's been around for 50 years, so a half a century of heart, of heart transplantation, although it still seems very esoteric. And so that's something that's available. And if you look across the world, there's somewhere around five, maybe getting close to 6,000 heart transplants in the world each year. And these are kind of from different parts of the world. The, the kind of orangish bars are from Europe, the purple bars are from the US, and the green are other, mostly Scandinavian countries. And you can say in, in the US, there's somewhere in, around 2,000 or 25 heart transplants uh, a year. So there's a fair amount of them, and we do a lot here. We do about 70 a year at, at Stanford. That kind of puts us about number two in the country in terms of volume. And the outcomes are pretty good. So if you get a transplant, whether you're 20 years old or whether you're 72 years old, the chance of you being alive at a year is about 90%. The chance of you being alive at about 13 or 14 years is about 50%. So and do we have people who are out 25, 30 years? Absolutely. So patients can live very long times on, this, on that same heart for, and do very well and have good quality of life. But what about people who aren't candidates for transplantation or who are waiting for transplantation and are just getting too sick? So what options do they have? They have these ventricular assist devices. So to kind of be fair, there's two big ones in the market. This is the HVAD, and it's made by Medtronic. This one is the HeartMate 3, and it's made by Abbott. And these things can totally take over the pumping function of the left side of the heart. And to give you a sense of sort of the size now, this is the size of the pump. And this isn't some giant's hand. This is like a regular dude's <laughs> hand, right? Uh, so I'm not, I'm not trying to pull one over on you. So, but these things kind of fit inside the chest. And, and these are not what you may remember from the you know, Barney Clark days, the Jarvik 7, this giant console when people can't go anywhere. These devices are getting people home, and they're out, and they're doing their thing in the community. You might say, wow, that sounds really fantastical. You know, it's hard to believe these things are out here. It's actually not as fantastical as you might think. So when you look at, you think heart transplants, boy, I don't know a lot of people with heart transplants. There's actually more of these devices being put in each year in the country than heart transplantation. So these things have actually become more common than heart transplants. So this isn't technology that's kind of the Jetsons and only a couple of people get. This is something that we do all the time. So in summary, so heart failure is really common. Um, and it's very costly. It's not only costly in monetary sense, but it's costly in sort of a social sense as well, as I showed you the impact not only on the person and their quality of life, but their caregivers. It doesn't matter why you have heart failure. Heart failure symptoms are the same. You're breathless, you're swollen, you feel tired, your belly feels distended. It doesn't matter why you have it, the symptoms are the same. But like I said, there's different types, and the two big types are systolic heart failure and diastolic heart failure. Your heart doesn't squeeze well enough. Your heart doesn't relax well enough. There's treatments. Um, the treatments for diastolic heart failure aren't as great as the treatments for systolic heart failure, uh, but there's still good treatment out there. But the big thing is prevention. And you may say, how does this apply to me? I don't have heart failure. Uh, you maybe you don't know anybody with heart failure. But like I said, a lot of the common things that people have that they see doctors for if untreated, particularly if untreated, can lead to heart failure. Again, hypertension, high blood pressure diabetes, high cholesterol, um, sleep apnea, all these sorts of things, if not treated well over time, can lead to heart failure, whether it's diastolic heart failure or systolic heart failure. And with that, I'm happy to sort of take any questions that you might have about heart failure or anything else cardiac related. Thank you so much. So the question was, how does the survival with one of these pumps compare to transplantation? That's a great question it's a, and uh, uh, something I actually wanted to address, but, and so I'm, I'm glad you kind of I feel like I planted you in the audience in the front row to ask that question. So if you, there's two big indications for these pumps. Um, so one is you're listed for transplant, you're waiting for an organ to become available, but you're becoming too sick. And so we put one of these pumps in so that you live on the pump at home. Um, and you wait for transplant on one of these pumps. And that's called bridge to transplantation. That's the indications kind of formal name. And so if you look at people who are, get the pump as a bridge to transplantation, um, at 30 days, the mortality is only about one or 2%. And at a year, about 
85 or 86 percent of the people are still alive. And, and you have to think about, so the people that get these pumps aren't people who kind of walk off the street. So how sick are they? So they're sick enough to be typically in the hospital. They're sick enough to typically be on one, sometimes two medicines through an IV 24 hours a day just to keep their heart functioning and keep their heart squeezing. And sometimes they're on a temporary form of a, a pump as well. So these people who are, are really sick. And if you look at a group of patients like that and they don't get one of these pumps, their survival at six months is usually 50% and their survival at one year is essentially zero. So they go from that to about 80, 85, 86% survival at a year. The other indication for these devices in the US is something called destination therapy, and it's a terrible name. There's a lot of terrible names in cardiology. People thought up things, and they thought, they, they thought it was clever, but then years later, like, yeah, not so much. So, so what is destination therapy? So destination therapy is for people who have a sick heart, um, and, and this, is, this is for people who have weak heart muscles. These devices don't work well in people who have stiff heart muscles. And they would be a candidate for transplant, but they're not a candidate for transplant because typically because of their age and their comorbidities. So there are other medical problems, things like kidney dysfunction, lung dysfunction, peripheral vascular disease, diabetes, and the like. And so instead of saying, well, you can't get a transplant, so we're going to let you die, they get a pump as an alternative to transplant. So they live on the pump as an alternative to transplant. And so when you look at those patients and their outcomes, they're not as good as the people who get them as a bridge to transplant because they tend to be older patients and they tend to have more comorbidities. But if you look at a year, about 70 to 75% of them are, are alive. And so if you look at them without the pump, we get the same sort of dismal results. If six months, typically only about 50% of them are alive and by a year, very few of them are still alive. So we're getting better. Um, the pumps are, the technology is improving, how we're managing the pumps is improving, uh, how we're avoiding adverse events on the pumps is, is we're getting smarter about all that sort of stuff. So the pumps have come a very long way. And you know, when I came out of fellowship in, well, when I came out of fellowship, I won't tell you when I came out of fellowship, um, the, the pumps, these, these kinds of pumps were only just becoming available. And the prior generation of pumps were bigger and didn't last very long, and the results weren't very good, and only a very select few patients got them. So whereas now, somewhere around 3,000 or maybe 3,500 people in the US get one of these pumps every year, back then maybe 250 or 300 patients would get them. So it's really had an explosion in these pumps because they're so much better. Thank you, Doctor. Very informative presentation. I really appreciate it. Um, you briefly mentioned about uh, fluid in the lungs being mm -hmm. one of the causes. Can you um, explain how the fluid gets there and sure. what the remedy is for the fluid? Yeah. So as the, either because the heart is stiff or because it doesn't squeeze really well and you get that back pressure. Um, so the pressure inside the, the uh, vessels that lead from the lungs to the heart goes up. And so when you think about blood, there's sort of the fluid phase of blood, the sort of the, the plasma, uh, and the plasma has proteins and other things in it, but it's mostly water. And then there's sort of the solid part of blood that's the cells, the white blood cells, the platelets, the red blood cells. When you put pressure on the fluid, it tends to weep out. The fluid can, the, tends to, if you think about um, uh, you know, putting pressure on a hose, the sort of the back pressure on it goes up, but if the hose was leaky, if it was a soaker hose, more of the water would come out of it because the hydrostatic pressure the, kind of pushes the water out of the blood vessels. And where does it go? It goes into the air sacs and the lungs, and it, and it interferes with the oxygen getting through uh, to the bloodstream. So you can think about sort of when you breathe in, your air goes all the way down to the ends of your lungs, sort of the business end of your lungs, these little sacs called alveoli. And the, and the space, the, the cells that uh, line that are really, really, really close to the cells that line your, your very small blood vessels called capillaries. So the oxygen kind of just diffuses across a very thin uh, layer. When you get edema or fluid in the lungs, that fluid kind of prevents the oxygen from going across it and into the bloodstream, and so that makes you feel short of breath. And the fix for that is to give you what we call diuretics or water pills. So basically you make your body pee that extra fluid out, reduce the pressures in the heart, reduce the pressures in the veins, and then that fluid will go away. You'll go back into the bloodstream and have less of a tendency to leak back out again. And the same process, that sort of hydrostatic pressure of the fluid coming out is what causes swelling in the legs is and what causes swelling in the belly. Uh, uh, over here, please. <laughs> Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, that's okay. 
Um, if uh, sleep apnea is treated, mm -hmm. is it still a risk factor? Yeah, so one of the things that sleep apnea does, that not only does it make you sleepy in the morning and um, you know, tend, to, tend to not feel as well, when you're sleeping, in, basically sleep apnea is you stop breathing at night. It's sort of periodic, periodic times where you stop breathing. You wake back up, you may not notice it, but you don't ever get into a deep sleep. But that sort of constant uh, kind of falling asleep, waking up, falling asleep, waking up, kind of revs up your adrenaline system and it causes blood, high blood pressure. And so sometimes people's blood pressure is driven by, a lar in large part, by the fact that they have sleep apnea that's not treated. And so by treating it, you kind of get rid of that. And so it helps. So if you have adequately treated sleep apnea, it becomes less of a risk factor over time. It potentially is still a risk factor. I, I have uh, an aortic valve replaced 12 and a half years ago. Yeah. I have a pacemaker and uh, wanted to know on the replacement how long do those things last. I was told originally five to 10 years. Now they tell me 10 to 15. At the end of the time, I'm 91 and a half. Uh, <laughs> is there a chance for replacement if I happen to live that long? And if so, what's it like? So do you have a metal valve or do you have a tissue valve? Uh, animal valve. It's An a animal tissue, valve. yeah. So the answer is like, the answer to your question is a little bit uh, like a lot of my answers to my, to the, when my kids ask questions, it sort of depends. It depends on sort of your age and how active you are and what your blood pressure is. But you know, the tissue valves can last for a very long time. Um, they can last decades, but not as long as a mechanical valve. They tend to last longer. So when younger people have bad valvular disease that we can't fix, ultimately if we can fix it and you can live with your own valves, just us kind of modifying them a little bit, it's much better. But the mechanical valves can last decades. Um, and so if you're young and you need your valve replaced, typically they get a metal valve because it lasts longer. And if you're uh, older, you tend to get a tissue valve because it doesn't need to last quite as long. And the, the benefit is you don't need to take blood thinners when you have uh, a, a tissue valve. When you, and you do when you have a mechanical valve. Sorry. Hi. <laughs> um, are there any current uh, research projects that you're working on or that colleagues are working on to address some of those gaps in treatment that you were talking about? Yes, so there's a ton. Um, as you can imagine, there's a huge pressure from payers and from hospitals even to address heart failure because it costs them a lot of money, it costs the insurers a lot of money, it costs the government a lot of money, and it impacts patients' lives. So there's a ton of uh, research going on. Can we add to that really long list of medicines that, are, that we know for systolic heart failure? Are there better things out there? Can we add to the list, the pathetically short list, of really good evidence-based treatments for a diastolic heart failure? Um, if you're in pharma and you develop a, a good treatment for, heart, for diastolic heart failure, you know, you'll be rich. You'll be able to afford a house in Palo Alto, um, <laughs> which none of us can. Um, so uh, there's, a, there's a huge interest in doing it, but there's, there's also helping along a huge financial interest in making it happen. And people are studying even things that are like technologies like this implantable hemodynamic monitoring. Can we manage patients better outside of the hospital and keep them from coming back? Because like I said, 80-ish percent of the cost of heart failure is being admitted to the hospital. So if you can keep people out of the hospital, you can potentially save a lot of money. And there's a lot of money being invested in sort of disease management systems. Uh, can we do things to help keep people out of the hospital and manage their disease at home? Because it's not just a matter of putting people on medicines and sort of shipping them out. As you can see, there's a lot of things that can contribute to heart failure. So there's a lot of things to be managed at home. And if you don't have the social support, if you don't have the financial wherewithal, it can be really difficult to manage yourself. And you end up coming back to the hospital very frequently. So there's, there's a huge interest. In the back. Um. So my question is a bit of a historical one. Uh, Dr. Norman Shumway and Richard Lower were one of the first few people yeah. uh, involved in uh, developing or pioneering the heart transplant. Uh, so the question is, uh, what were they doing differently back in the 60s uh, that led them to uh, sort of this breakthrough? So I think people had interested in it for a long time, um, but it seemed very out there. Uh, it took a little bit of sort of a you know, the surgeons tend to be uh, the cowboys of, of the, the medical world, and so it took, you know, uh, people who, who had been studying it for a long time. So it's not just one day that Norm Shunway decided, hey, I'm going to do a transplant. He'd been doing transplants in dogs for a long time and animal models and developing the techniques and understanding how it works and trying to figure things out. And to be honest, in the first, you know, 15 years, the outcomes were awful. 
and most of the country stopped doing them because the outcomes are so awful. And Stanford was one of the places that kind of kept soldiering through. And the big change that really came along was immunosuppression. And the thing, and immunosuppression that really came along sort of in the 80s was cyclosporin. And once cyclosporin was introduced and we could really modulate people's immune systems in a much more reproducible and less toxic way, then transplantation really took off. Not just heart transplantation, but liver transplantation, kidney transplantation, lung transplantation, the whole, the whole thing. And so that, the, the development of immunosuppression and good immunosuppression is what really launched the field. But it, all the, the research that went into it was sort of set up for years and years and years before the tr first transplant ever even happened. Right here. Uh, I have a friend who had a giant cell myocarditis, mm -hmm. which meant total heart failure. And she got to Stanford just in time, and they attached the external heart, which I was told would only, this was five years ago, would only last uh, a week. And during that time, while waiting for a heart transplant, someone came and demonstrated a mechanical heart. But the disadvantage was you had to haul around equipment or get it you know, hooked in. And you know, how is it now? Well, look, luckily, my friend got her heart transplant five days ago, five days later, and is doing well. Great. That's good to hear. But updates on the equipment. Yeah, so, the, so it, it depends. So the permanent mechanical support, the, the can of pumps that I was talking about before that you either got as a bridge to transplant and you waited for your transplant at home or this destination therapy where you lived on the pump. The pumps are the ones that I showed you in the picture. And the, it's powered by a cord that comes through your skin. And it's attached to what we call a controller, which is kind of the brains of the operation. And that's subsequently attached to a couple of small batteries. And you kind of walk around with that. You can plug it in. You can put it into your car charger. Um, you know, you can, all those sorts of things and be off, and be off your battery. Uh, but it's, it's, you can walk around with it very easily. Some of the older pumps are some of the temporary pumps that we use in the hospital for when people come in and they're really sick and they're not really ready to go for a permanent pump yet. They tend to be attached to bigger consoles that aren't as easy to get around with because they weren't really designed to be easy to get around with. They're just temporary and kind of keep you going until you stabilize enough to get one of these more permanent pumps. So I think that's probably, these pumps, at least the, the first one was ex existed back then and was here then, um, but it also depends on sort of how sick your heart was. And if it's just the left side of your heart that's sick or the right side of your heart that's sick, the pumps only really support the left side, so it depends on a lot of things. Well, Jeff, thank you. Please join me again in thanking Dr. Tudeberg for his great presentation today. Thanks. Appreciate it.